guys, Kevin Mitch here on the Big Head Pod, just sitting down, sitting here thinking about some of the whiskey that we've been been uh, privy to, being a part of the sponsor here on our show, Herman Marshall Whiskey. You guys get a chance to drink this stuff, try it out. The single malt is by far the best one they have. There's four kinds. They have a single malt, they have a blend, they have a bourbon, they have a rye. The order I would go in is a single malt by far. I just found this. Don't ever try and take this from me. I might have to beat you with the bottle. Then the rye, the blend, and then the bourbon. This stuff is phenomenal. Texas made and Texas produced here, guys. This stuff is unbelievable. So if you get a chance to do it, go grab yourself a bottle. This stuff is amazing. Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest, former major leaguer. I watched this man growing up being a Phillies fan, and he wrote a book, and he is an entrepreneur these days, Mr. Wes Chamberlain. Wes, how are you, sir? I'm doing pretty smooth, bro. Thanks for having me. (laughs) Uh, Absolutely, absolutely. Like I said, uh, growing up, uh, those early 90s Phillies teams, you know, those were my teams growing up and watching you guys. And uh, and the fun that that bunch that bunch had, and it, that, that's what baseball was to me. And that's but I think we've gone away from that to where we you know to where we are today. Um, but before we dive we I, we dive into all that stuff. So growing up as a kid, right? We all played different sports. You're from you grew up in Chicago, yeah, South Side, South Side Chicago. So you were I take so you were a Cubs fan? No, I grew up a Sox fan. Uh, you grew up a, a Sox fan, okay. Yeah. So, but baseball only. I mean, I figured growing up in Chicago, you play what? hockey, basketball. Exactly. Or what? what was your exactly? What were you doing? I, you had you had seasons like I did growing up. Yeah, you know that's what, exactly. I grew up a Chicago fan. I mean, but I grew up on the South Side, and my first um, major league uh, game was at Comiskey Park. So you know that's Helmet Dave, a dollar twenty five Helmet Dave, Bat Dave. You know, on the weekends all over the summer, you go. My older brothers take me there. And, I mean, hey, you know, and that's where uh, the love of the game came in because with my older brothers, they was all athletes. And so, like you said, in my book, all that, all that's in my book and stuff. And they the ones uh taught me the game of baseball, taught me life, taught me sports. So, so growing up, what was your sport of choice? Man, we did everything, dude. You couldn't – it wasn't no sport of choice. You had to – you had to – you either you either did it or you didn't. So you that that's what considered you an athlete in our neighborhood. Yeah. So you like you say, we went from season to season. Summer baseball, all that, whatever was going on, bad pickup games over the summer basketball, then the fo- football, the Bears, Walter Payton, uh, you know, uh, uh you know, the Super Bowl guys came later, you know, the ones that won. But Walter Payton was there. He was our guy, Reeve Swords, you know, uh, Doug Plank, Gary Fensick, all them guys uh, was the football. Then the Bulls was Artis Gilmore, Reggie Thid, that's before Michael Jordan, you know, and then the Blackhawks, Bobby Hall, all those guys. And, and I mean, just it just kept, it, you know, it was a character. It just kept going. So you just went with the times. Yeah, and you see that in these northern cities where all these, you know, the, the everything's kind of right in the same area. And these team, these guys grow up watching all this different stuff. I grew up just outside of Philadelphia, so you know, I'm I'm the same way. So I, I remember, you know, the big incident in Chicago was the disco demolition. How old were you when that went on? Oh man, I I, I don't know the exact date, but I know I was small. And when that happened, okay. that was I mean, I could have been about man. I think I could have been about five years old. I'm trying to, if I know the exact date, then I can tell you how old I was. Cause I'm 57 I, I now. I want to say it was like 72, 72, 72 yeah, maybe. So, yeah, I was just, that was, I was, I'm, yeah. So there it is. I'm eight, seven, eight years old. Yeah. So do you remember anything about, I just, you know, I've only seen highlights of the whole, of the whole thing. So uh, did you ever see anything or hear anything about all this? Oh, yeah, this we were right there, was, dude. I mean, all that was just like, that was a part of it. I mean, you had to pay to get in the stadium, but so we saw the stuff on the news, you know, growing up, I mean, I was growing up in poverty. I mean, we didn't have the privilege to go to the disco thing. So we, we get all the stuff out of it, out of it that comes, you know, on the news and like what happened and everybody telling us what went on at the stadium. And that was, man, that was why, I mean, for me, you're too young. We like, yeah, whatever. All we know is they just tore up uh, center field in Comiskey Park and cost a lot of money to, uh, to uh, fix it. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, gone are those days for sure. I think all the all the excitement nowadays is outside in the stands and everything else. So, you know, that was just it's always something I just just wonder if anybody had any ideas or thoughts on that. So growing up, so you said how many brothers you have? Oh, I got, I got uh, four older brothers and I had two younger brothers, but one's deceased, so I got oh, one. Man. Yeah, my my come from a family of eleven. I got two older sisters. Holy cow! Yeah, and uh, two younger sisters. I'm number seven. So you got number seven. So that must have been. Uh, I don't even know how you guys even were able to survive. I guess it was just survival of the fittest with all of you. No, it was love. Battling out on, sport, it was love on the sports and it was fields and everything else? No, it was, it was you know, uh, minority families back then was like close to knit, you know, and uh, to where it's like the society is trying to get away from that. And so with yeah. that, I mean, my grandparents raised me. And so our grandparents raised all of us. So when mom was at work, uh, and my stepfather, he was at work. There was, you know, the grandparents raised us, and then it was, it was, it was, uh, as you say, there was rules and regulations, things that you do, or you don't do, or you get your behind with, period. You follow according, and so they just trickled on down. So the older would keep uh, and tutelage the younger was like, look, we this is what we got to do. Mom come home, everything was in order. So, but for me. They was as I was as I was born, I was the baby, and then they was up in age, and so they were like moving out. So okay. that's how it was. Cause I had the the four under me, there's a big age gap uh between me and the next uh sibling. Uh, my next older brother is six years older than me. So with that okay. being said, you know, they was the the sixth there, they was already established. So okay. So, so going into high school, so you know, so, you know, playing sports, you know, growing up and everything. How were you able to s- kind of separate yourself, like you said, being being growing up in poverty, correct, and and going to college, going to high school, and then ending up going to play at Jackson State, correct? Yes. So, uh, talk a little bit about that, about trying to get out. You know, uh, you know, talk about inner city, getting out of right, trying to get out and go playing the sport that you love. And how did you choose baseball over everything else? Well, see, that's the thing, like. Like you say, growing up in poverty, we didn't even know we was poor when I say that because we grew up in the projects, but we we was like we wasn't in the high rise building. We were in the uh, in the, uh, what we what we what was then the Ida B Wells, which was like a little they were like little uh, condominiums. We had a back door and a front door with a four bedroom, but the other other parents around was in the tall high rise, the fifteen storage buildings, uh, seven storage buildings, and. Uh, it was it was like three four different settings of uh, projects in the area, like from 30, 35th to 39th. and now it's called Bronzeville because they tore all the projects down. But with that, like I'm saying, it's like man, we like okay, nobody's thinking like that. It's just a village, you know. Like a, it takes everybody, but we knows the stuff that's going on around in the neighborhood, things that you like you don't do, or places like you ain't supposed to be. So. Yeah. With that being said, that's where all of the, the things in the community, you know, the sports, the uh, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the churches, things of that nature. When they when all these things that are in the, uh, in the in your area, teaching you character, building character, teaching you etiquettes of life like you don't have to choose this way. You don't have to choose that way. Now, gangs were. We're in the area, but it was like, uh, you don't want to be over there. You don't want to do that. You know, things of that nature. Cause I grew up in the black, te- in the black Panthers area. So with all that, I mean, be, man, it was, man, it was just, it's, it's what it was. You know what I mean? It was the rioting. It was the Vietnam war and all that. My brothers, they didn't go to the Vietnam war because, um, uh, they had one. They had a little disability. One had something wrong with his uh, with his eye. He had hurt. He had hurt one of his eyes. So he's the oldest one. But anyway, he's like sixty four now. But things like that. Uh, when you're growing up, you're not thinking about that. You're just growing up and you living, you know, and things. And so, and so with with all that comes with all that comes in that era, you just taking life as it comes. And like you say, hey. When sports are there, I already knew that my mom couldn't afford to send me to college. So in any person of color in any minority area, the only way you get into college is through athletics or academics. And that's what uh, yeah. 
what uh, uh, really set it off in high school because once you went to the college days in high school and you're talking to the counselor, they're just telling you what colleges are available. They're not telling you how you're going to pay for it. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's, and that's, and like you said, you didn't know any better, right? Exactly. So they're just, they're just, they're just telling you all this. Um, but baseball ended up being your sport, but you, you know, is that, is that what you want to pursue after, you know, everybody has that, that, that dream of what they want to be as a kid, right? Well, you know, we, you know, you and I, we talked about playing different sports growing up. You know, I loved hockey. I love baseball um, and soccer and everything else, but you know, I've always wanted to be a baseball player, but you know, I really wasn't sure that would be my avenue, right? Until, until the, you know, something they, something just clicks, and you go, maybe I can do this, right? Did you ever have that moment of that, you know, of wanting to play baseball beyond uh, the high school side of it? Well, when I first went to Comiskey Park, and I got an autograph, I think it was from uh, Thad Bosley or Ron Lafleur, uh, one of the outfielders, and. We snuck down to the thing and, you know, they kick little black kids out. You, what are you doing down here? You know, hey, I'm just keeping it real. You know, what are you doing down here? And we trying to get balls. We trying to get autographs. We in there batting practice. And so he called. They called us over. And they threw the ball. They gave the ball personally to us in our hands. So I looked at my older brother and he was the stud. My older brother, his name is Larry. And technically, he was, he was the best athlete in our family. You know, they say the youngest one always you know, be the one that, that springs out. So he was the younger yep. of my four older brothers. And um, and so I was like, man, I was like, you know, shock got to, I was like, can I do that? You know, and he's like, yeah, you want to do this? I said, I'm talking about, can I play, the, you know, I want to play baseball like that, you know, like these guys. And he was like, what do you mean you want to play? I said, I want to play on this field. You know, I was looking at these yeah. grown men. And here I am like four years old. And he's like, man, yeah, you can do that, man, if you want to do it. He said, I'll help you. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. I mean, that was and baseball. He, I mean, that was being in that moment, getting that autograph, and they getting kicked out uh, of the section after we got the autographs. They, they left us alone then. But they was like, let us see your tickets, blah, blah, blah. And we had grandstand tickets, which I say, a buck twenty-five. So... Once that was over, you know, we went on up, got our little cotton candy, ice cream, and running around in the stadium. And I was just really and all watching the game. Just And it was like, man, okay, that, that's what I want to do. I was hooked. I mean, no matter what, I played all the other sports. They helped. They helped, uh, you know, to uh, your, your abilities and things of that nature. But I fell in baseball, fell in love with baseball at that moment. Yeah. So you get that you get that opportunity. Were you drafted out of high school? Or yes. No? Or is that even a possible? You were drafted out of yeah. high school. Okay. Was that you know that senior year and stuff? How you know people understand how that you know how that can work? You know back then, you know scouts around or was it, was it just something that you had any idea that that was even possible or is it just thought you just thought okay high school baseball and then I'm done? Oh no, uh, no. Well, being around my older brother, I learned everything. I mean, you know, he played like I said, he was the stud. And all his yeah. guys, so he, he was like babysit. They used babysit. Baseball was babysitting for me. So I was always the extra kid, like when nobody show up. Come here, Poke. Come on, go go out there. Go out, you know, because he they taught me the game. My brothers, they taught me to hit, stand up there, blah, blah, blah. Don't, don't you move. Hit the ball. You know, like that took the fear out instantly. So mm -hmm. a lot of people don't understand that about baseball, you know. So, but anyway, being around him. I was like a, a caddy, you know, then I just, whenever, I'm telling you, I've been, I've been playing with guys older than me my whole life. So I wasn't afraid. So when they put me in, they was like, oh man, he can play. He's like, yeah, yeah, he can play. I taught him and boom, that was it. And so with that, when I would play with older guys, I was able to carry my weight. You know, I didn't have no power, no strength, yeah. nothing like that. But I was like a, a leadoff hitter, a contact hitter, a good fielder with these guys six or seven years, 10 years older than me. But when I went back with guys my age, I was I was uh, the home run hitter. I was like Dave Kingman or Willie Starger. Uh, you know, yeah, you know, I was, a, yeah. you know, because all the home run hitters predominantly was left-hand batters were coming up. And uh, yeah. 
you know, Dave Kingman was home, but then Dick Allen, I, you know, when he came over and I was like, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I like Rich Dick Allen. I like Richie Allen. He was hitting bombs yep. for the Sox, dude. And he was like the only guy because all the other guys, like I said, for the White Sox was contact hitters. And then the only other uh, minority black player was Bill Madlock when I grew up, but he was a 300 hitter. So with that, I used to bat like, Everybody's, I knew everybody's batting stance, you know, play my own games, things of that nature, and mimic and copy and, and teach them what my, what my brothers, is, uh, you know, taught me how to hit. Then you just walk around playing by myself with bottle caps, sticks, bam, bam, just playing the game and having fun all summer long. Yeah. That's what I remember. Anything, anything I could hit with a wiffle ball, about a rock, yeah. a bottle cap, whatever, whatever was around. I, we were gonna try and hit it. And I'm like you. My brothers are ten and fourteen years older than I am. So I was, I always gravitated to the older guys. So yeah. as a kid, you know, they was, I wasn't cut slack, right? I'm sure you weren't cut no. slack either no. by your brothers. And that, and I think that helped me kind of respect the game and respect the older guys to that point. But also understand that you know, even though you're older than me, I could still, like you said, kind of hang in that in that mix, and it helped you to you know to get to that to that next level, right? So, um, so with all that and everything else, so you get so they come. So how did the whole Jackson State thing come about? Well, Jackson State came is because I got drafted out of college. But the thing is this, like you mentioned earlier, uh, we're seeing all these older guys get drafted out of high school and. Uh, Robert Triplett, he signed at 78, 1978. Uh, Otis Irvin, 1979. They both came out uh, out of Wendell Phillips High School and Stanley Cowles, uh, he pitched. So Robert Triplett was drafted by the Cubs. That was a big thing in our neighborhood. He grew right up. He, I, I'm yep. going to school with his little brother, you know, with his, both his brothers. Yep. And they, he going to make it to the major leagues. It's like, wow, you know, that's a big thing, you know. And he wound up signing out of high school. Otis Irvin was next. Uh, Stanley Cowell was first. He was like 1977. He was a pitcher. And I think he finally did get there with the uh, Oakland uh, Athletics. And uh, he got a cup of coffee. Right-hand pitcher threw real hard. Like about 95, I think he topped out about 100. They used to call him Baby JR. Baby JR Richards. Yeah, Richards. Yeah, so, but... uh, with that, seeing these guys getting drafted out of high school, I already knew that there's a possibility to get drafted. But there was never a thought in my mind to say, I'm going to get drafted out of high school. I'm looking at these guys going like, wow, watching them play over the summer for money, $2 a mm-hmm. man, you know, like, yeah. yeah, you know what I mean, for beer <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah, see, right. They don't understand. It was pickup games, but you had to have $2. $2 was a lot of money back then, dude. <laughs> Yeah, so, exactly. And so, yeah, by being around all that, that's what I'm saying. That's what my brother, he was going to school with these guys. My brother was playing with these guys, and he was beating these guys. But my brother, he just was like, uh, I mean, you know how you get fall by the sweat. He didn't get caught up in gangs or nothing like that. He just, uh, you know, he could play. You know how some guys got it, and they just don't pursue it. They just start kicking it with the girls and stuff like that. And so, it but didn't I still, work at the craft. I mean, it came natural. Exactly. Right? The, yeah. the girls come yeah. into play and he started being a ladies' man and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, but he could play. I mean, come on, Larry, let's play. All right, you know, and watching them. And that's how that's, and that's what I was saying. Like, that's how I would get in the game because somebody was late that didn't show up and they throw me to right field. And that's how I learned how to play all the positions because I was kind of tall. I was like about five, six, five, seven. But I, you know, real skinny, scrawny. But I wasn't afraid. And they was like, "Man, your little brother, he, he can play a little bit." And that's how I learned how to play all the positions. And so with that, I knew I could get drafted. But like I said earlier, the thing was the protocol is the college. You know, it's high school, college, and then professional baseball. If so, if so, it be. So what happened is that okay, you get drafted or you on the radar. We got. All these scouts coming, uh, Bill Brick, you know, God rest his soul, he's passed. He the guy that came out and uh, scouted us for the Pittsburgh Pirates, him and Art Stewart. And uh, But Bill Brick was the one that was pretty much communicating with us and with our coach a lot because he was like, he was on us. I'm talking about he mm-hmm. was on us to the point where, dude, the Pirates drafted three of us off one team, high school team, and it has never been done before again in Chicago. Yeah. So, and I went to Simeon High School, 
And uh, that was in 1984 when I graduated. Terrence Smith, he signed. He's the only one signed. Gerald Ingram, he went to Western Kentucky, and I went to Jackson State. Now, granted, we all was high recruited, but with that, my mom, you know, doing my mom was my agent and doing all the negotiations. She was like, well, we're going to see what they offer. And then I've got Steve's uh, Steve Zucker, Jim McMahon agent. He, I'll never forget him. Okay. Uh, God, Zucker, Steve Zucker. He, uh, okay. I met him and he was doing uh, my negotiated with my, with my mom, with the pirates. And my mom said, well, if you're this good at high school, you're going to go to college and they're going to draft you again out of high school. I mean, out of college in three years, she said, we're not going to tell them, but you're going to go to college. And then I allowed you to sign the contract because you'll be a young man and you'll be a little bit more prepared for life. And I said, yes, ma'am. So with that being said, all through, I, you know, we just playing and just going on as our way. So I ain't had nothing to say anyway. But uh, yeah. I, and I technically, I didn't know. I knew there was an idea of getting drafted, but I didn't know because I got drafted in the fifth round. And that was pretty good yeah. money back then. Out of high school? Yes. Out of high school, okay. Yes, so with that. That's a lot. Lovely. Yeah, with that. So that gave more, you know, negotiating power for colleges. And so with that, um, my coach, I was going to go to Southern University, which was the SWAC, because he told me I was going to come in and start as a freshman, period. He was the only coach, and I believe his name was uh, McCoy, he was there with, with one of my teammates before me who was a left-handed pitcher. He didn't get drafted, but he was going up on the radar in college because he had just won Swag mm -hmm. Rookie of the Year. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to follow his lead, go down there and play. So what happened, Jackson State coach came up, and I was away playing in the Michigan-Illinois All-Star game. And they, they him and my mom and my, my high school coach brokered a, a deal if he's going to sign us, he's going to have to take two of us. And I told him, I said, I'm not signing if I'm not going to be starting as a freshman. I might as well sign a professional contract and go on. And he was like, well, my shortstop, Julius McDougal, that was 1984. He was a starting shortstop. He was with Marvin Freeman. Because Marvin Freeman was from Chicago. So they, was, they both got drafted. Marvin went in the second round, and Julius went in the third round by the Cubs. And I said, well... That says right there, either I come there and start or I'm not. And so they worked out the deal, and I came in. He said, the best man win the job. I said, well, Don, ain't the best man. It was like, you can still pick him. I was like, I don't care about the competition. I'm not sitting no bench, and I'm not red-shirting, period, you know. Yeah. And it was settled. I, he like, you know, I got down there, and he because he never saw me play, Kev. And all these coaches. Yeah. Oh, really? So this yeah, so these guys, you know, they they recruiters. But he mm -hmm. did come up to meet me, but I was away playing. So I was like, you already know my story, coach. All you got to do is just see me play. And he was like so overtaken with my confidence because I was a little lot more mature because of my yeah. older brothers. And that was just a sign of, uh, you know, just being raised, you know. So with that, yeah. that's how I got to Jackson State. Sounds like, you know, a, that's a good thing, like you said, because you see that, you notice guys go from high school, right, to professional baseball, right? You're a lot of money, especially nowadays with with no structure, right? And your mom was telling you that that's the structure. She was she basically she's saying that, hey, you're not mature enough yet to handle going away. Right. Yeah. At, at, at that at that exactly. point. Right. She yeah. wanted you to go. And I'm sure she wanted you, the, the education process yes. was probably part of it as well. Yes. Right. She goes, you're gonna, yeah. I want you to go. To, Probably go to school. I want you to go to school so you're better, better educated for what the world's going to have for you, and still play baseball, right? And still, so being away from home, doing that, how how did that affect you at all? Oh, that made me that made me a man. Yes, period. I mean, you coming from Chicago, going down to Mississippi, Jackson, Mississippi, where they hung Emmett Till for whistling at a white girl at 14 years old. Jackson. Um, Emmett Till was from Chicago, and he was down there visiting his kin folks. He's 14, yep. so we already knew the story. So when I got down there, that was like a time warp, man. I mean, you you can't you can't even fathom that as a black man to leave Chicago and then go down there and then be more segregated with all the stuff that's going on, Jim Crow and all the thing. It was like I felt like I was watching. One of those old movies to kill a mockingbird all over again, dude. And and just couldn't like 
go nowhere but realizing that you you're a black boy you you know yep. and you're you you can't go you can't do certain things that white people can do and i was like 18 years old and i was like wow and i was like so i got to act like them i got oh how do i how, you know how do you live you know yep. yeah, i go from freedom to 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 slavery again at 18 like i can't come on man you can't make this stuff up you yeah. know, did your mom did your mom ever had that conversation with you of when, of knowing that you were going to Jackson State of knowing hey or just be prepared for this you know mentally and I'm sure, mentally and, and the mental stuff can wear on you physically so did she did she have that conversation with you going knowing you were going there? No, she she had it, but she didn't. It's it's the conversation is within the conversation. Gotcha. And so it's we, implied that you better understand where you're heading. Yes. And gotcha. with my grandfather being from Tennessee and my grandmother being from Louisiana, she already knew it. But she can't tell it yeah. to me from a she's telling it to me from a parent inside, a woman's side. And my stepfather, he was from Mississippi. So he never had the conversation with it. But that's why he was from Mississippi up north in Chicago. Okay. So the history and life is there. You reading it and you're learning it. But experiencing it is yeah. night and day. So his, And that's what I think they wanted you to do, isn't it? Yes, that's exactly yeah. yeah. That's what she wanted me to experience life by going down yeah. south. And I mean, yeah. it was not it was it's period. It's it's going away. I mean, I had all the big white schools, the universities, and every time I saw their baseball picture, they only had like one or two black guys on the team. And I'm like, okay, only one guy's playing. Why the other guy ain't playing if he's that good? But he's on the team so he can be a roommate. <laughs> Come on, Kev. <laughs> this is yeah. D1 schools, dude, in the 80s. And yeah. you get ready to go. I mean, I ain't about to name drop, but these was Big 8, who's no longer Big 8 no more. These are, yeah. what, you know, all the SEC yep. schools. And, you know, they recruit me because I got drafted, you know. And they like, this kid's going to be off the chart, blah, blah, blah. And But it's like when you get there, they're like, you're black, you're a Negro. And it's like, okay, I can play the I can play the game, but you're not playing me because I'm black, because I'm a Negro? What, what is this? You can draft me, you can sign me, but you can't play me. You sit me on the bench. And that right there, Kev, was the most important thing that an 18-year-old from Chicago can ever. I'm talking about me. Can yeah. ever experience in life because when I got there, I felt, dude, I didn't, I, it didn't even feel like it was real life, man. Really? I mean, I got off the train. Come on, I'm leaving Chicago. I'm leaving this big old downtown Chicago, Al Capone, all this stuff, and big Union Station. I get to Jackson, Mississippi. It's the train station was like a bus stop, bro. The police station was right there, and the bus station was right there. It's all at one stop. And I'm going like, what is this? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I mean, I wasn't laughing. I was just shocked. I was like, and then here come the, uh, here come, uh, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, man. And then Coach had somebody pick us up, <laughs> me and my guy. And we like we both woke up off the train. It was nine fifteen in the morning. We left at six six thirty at night, and we woke up to this. I was like, man, are we dreaming or what? <laughs> is this? You look at each other. Is this the right stop? Right, are we get off right. in the right place? <laughs> exactly, man. <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, man. Like, dude, what we in the twilight zone or something? <laughs> Man, we couldn't understand the guy who was talking to us. It was like, what? What you, what you saying, man? I can't I, I can't even imagine too of 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 you know of, of whoever picked you guys up. I'm sure it was it was some probably it was a probably a younger guy or something. Yeah, he was about here our he age. Is picking up, yeah. Yeah. Picking up picking up two black guys, right? Yeah. Off the train. Yeah. Right. And standing there and and I'm sure everybody just stand there staring at you, weren't they? Right. We, 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 <laughs> right. Like, we got our bags, yeah. our luggage, and we just sitting there on the platform. Like, <laughs> just like, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a station like we had to do in Chicago. Yeah. It was just like, get off. <laughs> like a bus stop. That's the best. Yeah. So, like I say. Was dude, there anything? 
<laughs> did he say was there anything colorful said to him at, at, at the interaction was it just like hello or was it just kind of you know um, what we was like uh i can't wait are we lost or something <laughs> I couldn't get over. Well, you, I couldn't get over the the police station and the bus stop all at once. <laughs> I wasn't even past that, let alone somebody picking me up. And we can laugh about it today, but at that time, dude, that's that's like are we. In, I'm telling you, it was, I felt like the movie The Twilight Zone. Are we in the right spot? You know, yeah. literally. <laughs> and then finally, this car comes up. And um, and he's like, I forget. He's like, uh, hey there, you know, like you the boys from Chicago. And he's like, what? He's like, who? <laughs> I'm looking for coach. You know, <laughs> I don't want to get lynched. <laughs> <It's not like laughs> that. You know, I don't want to get taken off. I'm like, man, my first, I'm, we about to get killed. My buddy was like, man, you, I said, man, what is you? I said, be cool, man. We just gonna make sure. Man, because it wasn't no <laughs> cell phones. It wasn't no <laughs> man, dude. And there, like, I'm sure there wasn't anybody there to help you either. Right? right? They, you just standing, two black guys just standing there, and standing then... there with bags, man. And so he finally came and said, "Well, I'm with Coach. I'm with Coach Brady from Jackson State." I was like, "Oh, okay." My heart was like, <laughs> "Okay, okay, yeah." yeah. <laughs> and that that, that that broke the ice. He didn't have no room for our luggage, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would have been something if he'd have left one of you there and take one at a time to get your back. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It was crazy. He had to call another guy. I was like, we can't take a taxi? <laughs> Dude, I'm from Chicago. He was he got to call somebody else. Man, you kept me serious. He's like, no, I'm going to call my homeboy. I'm like, what? I'm like, man, let's jump in the taxi. No, oh, man, that, that, leave that alone. You know, we like, what? <laughs> Oh my goodness! Dude, right, right. That's what I, I'm thinking. I, 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 yeah, I started to I come just, to him. I could have went to any any big university in the world. I mean, man, I was like, wow. You know, like I was just like, man, we signed, man, we going here. <laughs> Wait till we see the school. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even take a college trip, Cam. And I'm not, I'm straight up, bro. You cannot make this up. And I was like, all I was thinking was just, all the whole conversations now with my mom was just coming through my mind like, man, you know, just like, you're going to grow up. You're going to become a man. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> wow. That moment I became a man. <laughs> so when you finally got a chance to call your mom, what was the first thing you said to her? Man, I, I, was, man, I was like, mom, I think I picked the wrong school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm homesick. I'm ready to come Man, home already. Bro, bro, it was like, I was like, look, I ain't even registered. We can go somewhere else. Somebody else will give me some money. <laughs> this is, a, I told him, I was like, man, I'm coming back home. I wouldn't even talk registration. I said, I ain't registered here. Then I got on campus. Man, they took the dormitory. I was like, wow, it was like a big high school, man, with dormitories, you know, the, the campus. And I was just going like, man, this ain't like what I saw on TV, you know, like, you know, the other colleges and stuff, you know, you Big Ten, you looking at Michigan. Yeah. Because I had all them schools interested in me, signing me, you know, Illinois and Michigan, Indiana, all the Big Ten schools, you know, I'm right there in the area. And I'm like, yeah, I want to go to one of these schools, but they wasn't going to play me. They talking about maybe I had the red shirt. They weren't big on freshmen coming in and starting. But after yeah. seeing that, I was like, man, I don't know. You know, I, you know, you, you, you. <laughs> that red shirt sounded pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure getting off that train, getting off train in August, and it's hot and humid hot. down there, and you're out there. Yeah. Mississippi hot. It was so <laughs> yeah. knock you out hot, bro. I'm talking about you stand up, man, it slap you down. <laughs> yeah. I have never felt that kind of heat. Man, man, God Almighty! <laughs> and how long did it take you to kind of get acclimated to all this? Man, it took me a, it took me a while, dude. I'm serious, man. I mean, after finally <laughs> talking to Coach, I mean, we battled for the first before we registered. Man, I did not register. I'm serious. I was like, literally, like, no, I'm transferred. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> 
He was like, son. You're like the kid that the kid that don't want to get out of the car when you're going to the mall yeah. or something. No, I ain't getting out. I'm gonna sit right here in my pouch. I'm not going anywhere. Man, he come over, man, <laughs> man, dude. I'm telling you, it took a week and a half of uh, man before because we got there on the 15th. Registration had to be by the 22nd or the 23rd. So I, I used up all that time. <laughs> Oh, I didn't register to the Wait, final for, day, dude. <laughs> I literally, and he was every day. Are you gonna Are you gonna register? And you're still like, nah, nah still not ready. Nah, still not, not sure. Not ready for this. I was like, man, I think I think I should sign the contract like my buddy. I was like, nah, you know, like nah. But and then it's, I mean, even after they showed me the field care. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my laundry, bro! I said this 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 can't be the field. I was like, our park district back home was better than this. <laughs> <laughs> the high school field we played on was better than this, man. I was like, this is the field, man, <laughs> bro. You talking about a rude awakening, man? I learned, man. I learned what slavery was about for real. <laughs> Bruh, I'm gonna keep it 100. <laughs> oh my god, man, bro! I'm telling you, every old, every old movie, every old, everything came to me, man, all at once in the first two weeks, man. I was just like, not, I mean, I, I couldn't even. I still couldn't even. It took it, man. It, it, it was the fact of being homesick. It was just like this. This how people really live. And I couldn't, I, it took, it took a, man, the whole fall for me to get acclimated. The only thing that distracted me was that I was going to class and we had fall uh, baseball. But after that, it was pitch black and it was hot. And we had to wake up and do that all over again every day. <laughs> you were looking forward to the winners of Chicago. You weren't getting one in Jackson. Man. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I'm just like, man, I'm just, man. It took the whole fall. It took the whole fall. Man. But once you got acclimated to all of it, it, it that motivates you. are like, all right, what do I need to do to get out of here? Yeah. Is that what, is that? Yeah. Cause right? I, three years is going to be a long three years if I can't figure, right? Because unless the draft rules change, right? It still had to be your no, junior year. No, you had to go three years. If you transfer, three, once you okay. played, you had the red shirt. It wasn't that little stuff okay, like it is today. Okay. So that's why I was like really saying, like, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not no, I'm getting out of this before it, before it happens. And he called my mom. I'm telling you, he called my mom in the office. And we, we you know, we we passed the phone back and forth. And she was like, you know, we had we had the conversation over the phone. She was like, no, nah. she was like, you're not coming back. And man, I've just my heart dropped. <laughs> I mean, I did everything but cry. I did everything but cry. I was like, "Yes, ma'am." You know, coach knew. Coach knew. I was like, because Southern wasn't like uh, Louisiana. wasn't like Mississippi. Southern University, dude. Uh -oh. It was. It was more like metropolitan a little bit. It was. It was Southern. Yeah. It was country. But it was not country Mississippi. It was like what Deion Sanders saw when he went there. You, yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. worse than it was worse when I was there. <laughs> what, what you know, looking at all this stuff, what is coach telling you? Just Man, you know, like it's, you said, it's normal to him. It's, it's yeah. <laughs> coach, I played on better stuff back in the hood on these fields. Man. What do you got me playing? You didn't want to play infield, did you, at that point? No, and I was just starting to shortstop. <laughs> yeah, I'll go to the outfield. Man, I was like, I don't even want to play. I, don't even want to play. I told him, I don't even want to play. I don't even want to play, man. I just told him flat. That's the first time I ever really thought about giving. The only thing that kept me going is I wanted to get to the major leagues. That's all. That's it. That's and that's, it. What, that's the conversation you had. It kept going. Yeah, after <laughs> that. motivated you, right? That was the motivation to get you to, to go. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you can't get off of it, can you? <laughs> <laughs> the motivation was, look, I was already motivated to get to the league because you get drafted, but I'm talking about, it was like, I couldn't get past how long I was going, you know, the three years. 
<laughs> yeah. Three years of this. I was, I was only weeks on, on that part. It was, man, I was like just, oh, Lord. Oh, my laundry. Man, I was just, I mean, like I said, she said I couldn't come back home. I was like, you know, I was still stuck on that. That's why it took me a whole week and a half to register. <laughs> And I'm Mom like, doesn't want me home. You down here. You got to suck it up. And then uh, uh, Lloyd McClendon, who played for the Pirates, his nephew was there, and he had red shirted, so he was a couple of years older than me. He, like, we became buddies. He was, like, the one leading me. And he was like, yeah, my uncle playing blah. I said, oh, that's your uncle, blah, but he's from Indiana. So he kind of, like, because I was just, it was just me and my, my my guy from Simeon. It was just us. Yeah. And so yeah. then we found out there was a few people from Indiana, but they weren't on, they weren't playing. They was, you know, on the bench. And I'm going like, what is this? You know, they bring all the Northern guys and sit them on the bench and act like all the Mississippi guys better than us. Oh, man, it was a raucous. It was, man, it was racism on racism, man. I never faced <laughs> black racism before. <laughs> Man, I dealt with white racism up north, you know, where we stayed to our side, and you like that's why we couldn't. That's why I wasn't a Cub fan because growing up we weren't allowed to go to the Cubs games. I mean, you look on the TV, Jack Brickhouse. We only saw him on the TV. It wasn't no black people going to the Cubs game unless they worked at Wrigley Field. That's why we were all White Sox fans. <laughs> now you did tell me how to deal with this. This shenanigans. <laughs> man, you turned a red into a tomato, bro. <laughs> oh, that is funny, dude. Just hearing the this, this stories and stuff of guys yeah. growing up down there. It's fun. <laughs> man, man, you grew up in Philadelphia, see? Come on, Doc. Shoot. I, yeah, I just, I mean, you. I, I love hearing these sto- the stories of guys. That, I had Orlando Hudson on here talking about and about just being, he's from South Carolina. I mean, the yeah. same thing. But, you know, and it's. And that's the thing, though. It's it's kind of how what just ingrained. Like right? said, so growing up, we grew up black, white. It didn't matter. We just were playing. It didn't matter what we were doing, right? Yeah. You know that, right? And you hear these stories of that, and I'm and your people going, that that stuff's not right. And then you're, I, I'm living it. But then, like you said, then you saw the the black on black racism stuff going, and you're going, oh gosh, it just. What do I do now? Right. Just, it's like, yeah. I got to get out of here. <laughs> Where am I going to go? You hear about Jeff Stone's stories? You hear about all these guys in the minor leagues? How, the, how they was just run with no shoes on and get drafted, I mean, get signed? And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, like, what? They they timed you in the cornfield? <laughs> like, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even imagine that. <laughs> with no shoes on, he was running a 6-3. <laughs> in the 60s. Like a six three six two, dude. I say, man, you faster than the night. <laughs> I'm running a six five six six in the six. I'm like, what? Bro, I'm like, man. I'm telling you, bro, you can't make it up. And it's all fruition today. That's what's so sad about it. Twenty first century. That was in the eighties, and we in twenty twenty three. And this, it lied dormant so much that it explode. Like, we're in a nuclear war today, bro. I'm telling you. It's, and only only reason why we're able to get along today is because it's all out now. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and we ain't getting along. It's just, it's just you, you, you go along to get along. <laughs> And, that, and that's the beauty of the baseball side of it. We right. see everything, every race, every nationality, yeah. and we played with right. Yes, and you, yes, and it, and it never seemed to. It seems like baseball is the most integrated when it comes as far as the the, the, the yeah. demographics. Yes, yeah. right. I mean, I mean really? everything. So, and, it, <laughs> and they're all everybody's, and it's just people. But hearing stories <clears throat> because we can joke about it, right? These, we this ain't older, joking. It's the truth, bro. <laughs> no, but I, but I mean these kind of conversations we yeah. have. Uh, Curtis Wilkerson always talks about stuff like this, man. He just and he just uh, he's like, I, whatever, man. I just bust shot. But it's 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 funny hearing right. the story because hearing these stories, yeah, and because it truly happens. Of uh, and then it, and then we had this conversation. It's just you talk about it then and how what. It, but back then you weren't laughing, 
right? No. Because you didn't know any better. No. <laughs> and, and now these stories and people, no, nah, it wasn't like people. Right. Yes, it was. Yeah. You have firsthand knowledge of it, you know, and, right. it's, and hearing about it. And, and oh my god, we only laughing I, because it's the truth. That's why yes. we're laughing. And it's like, yeah. man, you can't make this stuff up, dude. This ain't, uh -oh. this ain't no uh, Jackie Robinson story. You know, it's, you yeah. know, this, like they say, oh, it's true events. No, they, they just did that Hollywood style, dude. Jackie went through worse stuff than that. Come on now. But they got to Hollywood it up. Bro. Right. 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 They, yeah. They, they wrote a script for that, bro. Yeah. Come on now. No, this ain't the yeah. five heartbeats. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness yeah lord man but, but, i'm telling you this stuff man boy i tell it, you what it was the <laughs> it was the worst three years of my life but it it turned out to make me the man i am today because like my mom said you would grow up i grew up i became a young black man dealing with life and yeah and with that said, I mean, the the Latin, I mean, the, the Latinos came after you get signed a contract here and there. That's another whole story. We ain't even yeah. tap, we ain't even we ain't even took a sip of water on that, you know. Yeah. But dealing with Mississippi and dealing with the SEC, all the white schools we play, Mississippi State, uh, New Orleans, uh, all LSU. Dealing with all the racism, they would call us everything but the N word, coon, what black cat, everything but a. They called us, and we man, we on a campus playing them. Will I play Will Clark and Palmero? I was my freshman starting. I was raking. It didn't make a difference. You could play, but you can't play with us, man. I'm I'm three for three with. I'm raking. I'm I'm like going. I'm hitting. Cliff Brantley and Bobby Thigpen, they close us. He coming from right field, coming in, throwing 95. I'm drilling him. I mean, they like, who is this black kid? They like, that's the Chicago kid. The Pirates drafting him. And they was like, oh, okay, because we ain't never known nobody to hit like this or play like that. We'll come over, put his arm on me and stuff like and talk. Man, I was just, okay, like, really? I'm a freshman, man. And I'm going like, okay, this, this is life. This is like... I mean, I still couldn't grasp it, man. I was just like, okay, because I'm playing against St. Rita white boys up in, in, you know, the Catholic schools in Chicago. They were predominantly white, all the Catholic schools, because they, they got money. They, they cost 10 grand a year. And if a black person or a minority went there, you had to get a scholarship. So we weren't thinking about that, you know. So my school was uh, black, Simeon and Dunbar. Uh, they were vocational schools, good educational schools, which taught us a trade, and you learned to work as soon as you got out of high school. Like I say, we weren't going to college like that unless you had good academics. But we had good sheet metals, uh, plumbing, welding, all the the uh, machine drafting, auto mechanics, auto body, all anything that you want to go in the work field, you got a job. We had job employments that would... Uh, Prepare. As soon as we graduated out of high school, we had jobs lined up for us like we were in college. And so, yeah. therefore, you were more educated and more uh, professional. Yeah. On dealing with all, on on, uh, on all that. And, just, and like you said, it's amazing how baseball, once, you know, like you said, it, it, you see a lot of whether, you know, guys putting other guys down until they realize, they see this guy can play, right? And then it seems yeah. like it seems to... Almost like, do you belong on the level, right? Yeah. Like you said, you're at a predominantly black school, yeah. right? And you're playing against these schools, and all of a sudden, who's this guy? And then, all right, maybe he can. Maybe he is on our level, right? And that seems to, because baseball players, we we, we draw a line. Yep. We, draw, we don't draw a line. We just draw the circle. We draw a line. Small. And we draw. We draw and, a line. And then, but once we, we, but once we realize you can tell that line, then you got to get in the circle. Yes. Then, then you do it. And I think that's what you're talking about as far yes. as, as being at those schools and everything else. So, and it, like you said, you had to grow up in a hurry, 18 years old. Yes. <laughs> you're down in, in the deep South and you've got to grow up <laughs> and it, and it helped you though. Right. It, oh, yeah. it made you who you are today. Yes. So you're th so those, those three years of, of, of fun you had getting out and then finally getting into pro ball and playing and um, getting, to, you know, going through the minor leagues sometimes can't be any, just as bad, oh, right? It was, some even, of those worse. Minor league it was right. even worse. It was even worse. But 
<laughs> but after coming from Mississippi, I was prepared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what are some of the towns that you played in? Because I've heard of some of those old oh, school dude. towns that are. Man, come on, man. There was some of them towns we was playing in, man. Man, it wasn't fit. I didn't even think people was. I, man, man, I didn't even think yeah, them towns was real, man. I mean, we was going to South Carolina. We was going to Savannah, excuse me. Uh, Macon, Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, uh, Alabama. Oh, oh, wait, let me see. What, what was we? Uh, a ball. I first went to Watertown, and then when we went to A ball. I didn't go to low. I went straight to uh, high A ball. I didn't go to low. My low A ball was Watertown, but Macon, Georgia League was the second level. But I went straight from Watertown to Carolina League to uh, Lynchburg. Is, yeah. All over there to the <laughs> yeah to the red <laughs> Confederate states. <laughs> like they got a city name Lynchburg, man. Salem, uh, Charlotte, man, bro, man. <laughs> I was like, man, how they got teams over here, <laughs> man? I can't even. Under- I was, dude. When we got to them places, they were talking. Let's go eat. I said, I'm good. <laughs> If they had, look, there was some nights, there was some nights that real literally, literally, if it wasn't pizza that was being delivered, if we didn't eat, I, I, I ate Snickers and a bag of chips. I'm good. <laughs> and that was only from the, the hotel, like right there, the vending machines or whatever. Period. Yeah. You know, because they'd tell us, well, there's a breakfast, you know, we can go over here and get, man, I'm not going there. I ate whatever they, they bought to the stadium. You know, I'm I'm good. <laughs> I am good. Look, get us in here these three days. Put us back on the bus. Get us back to our place. Oh my goodness! And that's why but, a lot of them Latin guys. Were... That's why a lot of them Latin guys was going to jail, dude. They was you know messing with them them girls down there. Yeah. And them country boys didn't play that. They carried their guns on the trucks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness! And they didn't speak the language either. And you'd been around it and understood it. Yeah, and they Spanish. And, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and them girls drunk, and they like just man, you better leave them girls alone, boy. Even man, they weren't even a thought. <laughs> Playing through them things, and then we be in spring training. And in fall ball, instructional ball, hearing the stories, they like preparing us. We didn't know they were preparing us for spring training. We, once you yeah. make that club, don't go yeah. to here. They'll let you. And man, yeah, you man. <laughs> oh I'm like, man, goodness. how is this legal? Is this what you got to go through to get to the major leagues? I was in, man, I was telling you talking about prepared after leaving Mississippi. I was focused. <laughs> yeah. I was in the and zone. It, like, dude, I got to get out of here. Ain't no money down here. It's racism down here. I'm not trying to die down here. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, but like you said, you were prepared for it yes. from the time you were. And and like I said, that's carried you to where you are today, yes. right? It's helped you become what you've done. Played, you know, I, played in the big yes. major leagues for those f- for five six years. You did, and yeah, and and leading up to it, and and everything else. I mean, it's the, like I said, the story you can tell because yeah. of what people. But no, that was no, it, it's exactly what it was because you lived through it. You're able to yes. and understand it. So you so going through all this, like you know, you, you talk about those those early '90s the Phillies teams you played on. You played with some. There were some studs. real, real rip. Yes, but yeah. they were some guys that were just they were off the wall group yeah. right through that whole yeah, and, yeah. and those stories and everything else. But um, you know, talk, just talk about that a little bit. Just being with those those '90s Phillies teams and 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 what it meant finally finally getting to the big league level and understanding and seeing those guys that you probably saw in the SEC and everything else and playing with them on the same field. Well, first I was with. Barry Bonds had got drafted with me, but I didn't sign. Barry signed in like 86 or well, 80. Uh, I got drafted 84. Barry's two years, three years older than me. So he was at Arizona State. So he he was already signed, I think, about 85. 85, Barry signed, I think. And then when I got down there, 
he was just not coming up to the show. I remember him uh, with a sledgehammer. They was like, this kid's here, this kid's there. And I was like, yeah, he went to Arizona State. He went through some of the stuff, you know, from the Arizona State on yeah. the racism over there. But he didn't go through the stuff because... I put it to you like this. <laughs> the joke is when, when black guys go to white schools, we'd be like, he the he the he the whitest black kid I ever know. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, his dad was his dad was Bobby Bonds, you know, granted and all, but you we can say that because we I know him. You know, yeah. we know him. It ain't like I'm talking behind his back or nothing. And when we yeah. was yeah, we was a spring train. We was like, dude, you don't even sound black. You know, like, <laughs> he's man, what are you talking about, man? I was like, man, dude, put you behind the wall, dude. We couldn't even figure who you out. <laughs> and that was a joke, so he used to get pissed off. <laughs> Cause, and he wouldn't come around us, dude, no more, you know, because after he got his cup of coffee, and I mean, like I say, you know how some of the big leaguers come over and yeah, you know, yeah. but Barry was still young. And so, and yeah, you, he's like I'm saying, yeah, you stud, yeah, you can play, but you know, hey, the ribbon starts. You know, we all in the, we all, hey, we all crabs now, you know. And yeah. we know you're gonna get your first, we know you're gonna get a good look, but it was just like like what it was. So now when uh I signed in 87, Barry got his little cup of coffee, and then the Jeff King comes in from Texas. And he's with Miss Universe, so we like, man, ain't no young guys getting up there. It's all veteran guys. Jim Leland comes over, and he brings Bobby Bonilla from the White Sox. They get Andy Van Slyke, then R.J., Jerry Reedus, uh, Gary Gary Reedus, R.J. Reynolds. And we looking at this Major League roster, and we like, okay, man, are we going to make it? You know, we can, what, what's the what, – it's like, well, you know what? It's 32 clubs out here. They all scouting us. Somebody going to give me an opportunity. And yeah. that was my goal. That was my mentality. And that was my plan. And once I started meeting the former major leaguers who I watched, Hal McCray was our hitting instructor. And I just started putting in the work, Kev. And I mean, it was like yeah. whenever they would say, be here, I was, bam, I was there 30 minutes early. I was there before everybody got there. I was the last one leaving because, like I said, that mentality of being in Mississippi never left me. So I'm like, yeah. I'm not going I'm not going to be out of work. They're not going to say that I'm lazy or lethargic. They're not going to have no excuses. I don't care what they say about me. They won't say that I was never on time or ever, ever late or didn't work, period. Yeah. That was it. And yeah. so with that being <clears throat> said, you know, the game, uh, Jeff Cox was my first uh, manager, and he, what he told me was this, and I, I draw to, we had a lot of former major leaguers when we were coming in, and they, some mm -hmm. would take a liking to you, and some of the other guys who didn't play pro ball, if they didn't like you, they were going to bash you in them coaches' meeting. And, and Jeff Cox told me when we used to uh, be on the road, and he used to show us the reports on what we did and the game reports and blah, blah, blah. And he was like, yeah, he said, but he said, that's good. That's what you need. He said, but it's the other thing, how you carry yourself. <clears throat> and he was like, always saying, carry yourself professionally. And I was like, yep. yeah, okay, bam. And that right there, it never left me. And with that, that's why when I got around them big leaguers, I would just be mums the word, mouth shut. Eyes open, ears open, and just let them come. And, and that's how it was. And so I, I put a lot of fear in them big leaguers, man, because I didn't joke with them. I didn't play with them. And I was like, it's five or six positions on that major league roster, and I'm going for one of them outfield positions because they, they moved me from the infield to the outfield. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I can play. But see, I, I know I can play short, second, third, first catch, in the outfield, okay, this, this is baseball. Yeah. So with that being said, that was my approach after I signed that contract. Yeah. I got there. I outworked all of them. Whenever they brought us over to the big league, I was outworked. They was like, who is this kid? They was like, oh, that's a – I was poor. They, well, what would happen? I got drafted at a fifth round in high yeah. school. I was projected for the number one pick. 
we had a conference game with Mississippi Valley State, and the kid bought a gun to the game, Mississippi Valley, and we got into a team fight. I'm pretty sure you heard about I don't know if you heard about it, but they tried to label me. They tried to label me and say, I bought the gun. And that blew my stock. That blew my uh, draft stock down. Oh, really? Yeah, we had a fight. I got suspended because <laughs> they're going to say, oh, because of the team brawl. But the guy, uh, he started the fight right on the field, uh, a double play or whatever. And uh, he, he he tried to kick me. He, he did. He kicked me uh, in the chest or the face, but I threw my arm up. Uh, yeah. The line drive hit the second. I was on first. Threw the ball. I made it back safe. And then the overthrow went up, up, up the line. Uh, went towards the dugout up the field. I got up to run. He stepped. He spiked my hand, and I hit his hand off. And then he uh, tried to kick me in the face. And then boom, that was the fight. So we brawl. And when the brawl was kind of settled down, he went to the dugout, got a gun, came back, shot it two times in the air, as if he was looking for me to shoot me. Really? And, yeah. I, I forgot his name, but he wore number five. And when he did that, I mean, Jackson. Everybody was at the game, security and police. Everybody was hit the ground. And so then yeah. he was left standing up looking like a clown with a gun in his hand. And so he was like, there he is, number five, number five. That's what I kept saying, number five. So the teammates kind of surrounded him, threw a coat over him because he was in his uniform. Yeah. And I don't know what, how, dude, I don't know how he got away or whatever. Maybe because, you know, they threw the what whatever. But they stopped the game because that was the second game. That was a doubleheader. We had already run the first game. So now... There, the first story goes out, Wes Chamberlain brings a gun to the game, shoots a game. What? And that right oh, there, geez. that's right there, that lets me know yep. that my status in life, it was kind of like the Allen Iverson story and Randy Moss story. And since I was the, the draft pick, they're going to implement me with a gun. And they, you know, the story, they don't come back and literally apologize, but they send a party, but the story don't go out like that. Yeah. So for that moment, and that was my draft year. That was my draft, my junior year. And the Pirates had already, you know, they was like, gonna, you know, everybody was, I was going first round. And that that right there, Kev, that hurt me. I, that's the first time I really broke down and cried because I knew my stock, it was labeling me like I was a Chicago kid, gang <laughs> affiliate and all that. And that was never... Never, Kev, never. That hurt me so bad yeah. that my coach, you know, I felt my coach didn't back me the way I, I felt that he should have backed me. I said, Coach, I said, they said, like, I had a gun. I said, Coach, you ain't even have a conference, a news conference to denounce it. We like, well, you know, we, you, we know you didn't have a gun. I was like, Coach, it's all on the news. That's that's opening up the, the highlight. Yeah. You know, so, but... That right there, that was that that was the defining as going before signing my contract, and that dropped yeah. my draft status. And so that's why that's what made me to say never be outworked, and always stay professional. And that's what Jeff Cox helped me with. And that right there, they tried to say a few things when uh we got instructional ball in the spring training, but the Pirates nip that instantly in the bud and say, don't you never bring that nobody ever bring that up about him again. And that's why a lot of people don't even know about it. Only people who know it, what, what happened, you know, as some stories, it ain't yeah. buried, but it ain't not, no. not that because I was never convicted. I never had a thing yeah. of felon. So yeah. I, I, I was grateful for the, uh, the Pirates, the way they handled it, but they drafted me fourth round. But I worked my way up to become the number one prospect in the organization. And when... Jeff Leland, when they was making the, when I made the roster after the strike, Jeff Leland wasn't going to bring me up. So they did the irrevocable waivers and they forgot, Larry Doherty forgot that it changed in the strike year. And that's how I got picked up on waivers and got to the big leagues with the Phillies. Gotcha. Bam. Okay. <clears throat> and you're right. So that scar that, right, you said the damage has already been done, right? It's already been said. Yeah. The scars, the, the label's already there regardless of what. And, yes. you know, they can't backtrack. And and that's, like you said, well, an apology. Well, like you said, it's an apology. You can say it, you're not doing anything to help me out. But like you said, it's just part goes back to your character, how you were and how you are today of, of you know, of, of what that led you to be able, you know, be able to play and be successful five, six years playing in the big leagues. And then, and then after just getting into, 
you know, business relationships, the stuff that you do to be able to help, right? From from what we've learned, that's that's what we're yes. trying to. do. If we can help one person, we've done our we've done our job. So, you know, so talk a little bit about um, your book that you wrote. Just 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 briefly. I know we've t- we've we've hammered on a lot of what you've been through, and just you know, what kind of inspired you to write this book, and and what was the what was the premise of of doing it? Well, the book is uh, just about you know. I mean, you know what people always say, hey man, you ought to write a book. You know, man, you blah blah blah, and it just came along. So. I just say, okay, I just do it just to do it, just to see, you know, like if I can do it and like, okay, I can do it short to the point, see how it is. And uh, I did it on a whim, but I didn't want nobody to be trying to tell my story and, 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 um, you know, uh, make it uh, Hollywood stuff like that. No, I just wanted to tell a story, tell the beginning of it. And, get it out there so that you can hear from me and then it can help me as a writer, help me professionally because we already know that once we're playing sports that the day of retirement is going to come. But what are you going to do after that? You know, what can you do? Can you better yourself, continue yourself? Me, I never wanted to work for anybody else. I mean, I didn't mind being involved in professional sports because I know if I'm being involved in professional sports, I know what comes along with that. Like being an ambassador, being a mentor, and getting paid for it, and as a businessman, that that was my uh, my goal and approach. That if I never made it to the major leagues, I wanted to be my own boss, and I've always yep. have, and so I've maintained that. And I know that that um, not being able to learn how to manage money because you're not taught it, but being a professional athlete, my agents that I've had had taught me how to use my money to make money and things, which has kept me afloat today in life. So the book. Mm-hmm came about uh, with that, with conversations. So I went on ahead and did it. And I put it in an ebook. I never put it in a hardcover because I felt like, you know, it's my first book and I don't want to have all these printed copies and then I got to give it away to where is that I let it create its own uh, revenue and let it do what it do. And with what we got going on today with uh, internet, things of that nature, streaming, uh, people can uh, go online and, and get it. And it's only 100 pages. Yeah. And the book's called In the Game? In the Game. Okay. And that's just you come up with that one. name? Huh? That's just volume one. Okay. You came up with the name of it? Yes. Okay. In the Game. I call it game. In the Game like the game of life. Remember when we play like yeah. Monopoly and mm-hmm. things of that? So I just put In the Game because we're in life. And life is, a, is an adventure. You know, we're on a journey. And we're born to die. So with that, I, I used it. I played it with that. I played it off with that, with that scenario. Like in gotcha. the game of baseball, <laughs> we do this. But in the game of life, we do this. So I intertwined both of them and came up with that title. Gotcha. It sounds like it's, like you said, what you, what we've learned from our, everything that we've been brought up, you know, how we were raised and people around us have kind of molded us to where we are today, right? To be able to to yes. help and to to reach out. And that's all it is, right? That's what this yes. book's about. Just here's the story. You know, here's a yes. quick, if anybody, like I said, one person reads it, you've done your job with your book, correct? Yes, right to the point. And then, like I say, when I want to start on volume two, I could do volume two. But if number yeah. one hasn't taken off, why do volume two? Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like you said, it's all about, like you said, it's who, who, that's all it is. One person hears it and they go, hey, you know, maybe that's, you know, that's what, because there's always somebody out there that needs to hear it. It's just a matter of getting it in the right hands. Yes. Correct. And that's what you're doing now as far as, you know, doing right, doing lessons and everything else as well. Right. Telling yep. that story and, you know, how you learn, who, you know, because the game today is completely changed from when we played it. Yes. Right. It's, it's become a me first mentality. And uh, it's, it's kind of hard to watch sometimes because, because of that. Right. The work. I don't even watch they only it, man. See the, well, it's, Being uh, honest. I can't either. I- <laughs> no. They only see what's on TV, right? They don't see the work that gets put. They don't see you at Jackson State down there, right? Being a black man in the South, what you have to deal with mentally, physically, and on top of looking at the baseball field that you had to play on at that time, and the stuff that you would hear traveling around doing that. All they see is, oh, that's why Shamelon he was on TV, right? Yeah. yeah, you didn't see the other, and that's the, and that's I think that's what this generation misses the the work, the blood, the sweat, the tears that go into it, and it's. And it's hard. It's hard to motivate this generation. But like you said, we all figured out what motivation it was to get us to that point. You know, like you said, it was, oh, this feel, there's got to be better than this, right? And yes. You could have quit. You could have quit at any time, but you didn't, right? You it, That perseverance that you have. And I think that's a word that's probably gone by the wayside now, too. Yes. They just think that they have it 
all right, I watch it on TV. I automatically got better on it as opposed to what do I need to do? They don't ask the questions. They just want, they want information being told what to do. Yes. And then they can't put the work in. If the, that's the difference. We were, we got the information and we put the work in. They get the information. They like, I know how to do it. No, you don't. You didn't even read the freaking instructions. How do you know how to operate a phone? They don't even give you, they don't even get instructions with the phone no more. You got to Google it now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Or you can become the phone guru here. You can figure out ways to, because everybody else, they watch hitting online. Now I can go teach yeah, it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> this stuff. They got these kids standing on BAP's board. <laughs> swinging water jugs and swinging. They're doing, uh, they got the, the rings and the gymnastics. They're trying to twist them and everything else. I mean, what in, oh gosh. <laughs> what in the Sam Elliott is going on here? <laughs> It, it, oh man, it's can you imagine our girl, our hitting coach would have beaten us with that stuff? What are you doing? <laughs> we could talk for hours on this subject. Well, we have to definitely have to revisit this one at some point and talk because we could talk for hours on right, our, right. on the stuff. That, right, <laughs> that's another whole subject. That's another, that's another whole hour. <laughs> And that's what I mean. But oh, I, like man. I said, I'm glad that you're able to to teach that and what you've learned. Yes. That, like you said, just life in general, right? And that's life. that's what it's about. I've got three little ones I'm trying to raise and and do that. And but it's hard, right? You said trying to no. motivate. I'm like trying to motivate. That my brothers, I wanted to be better than my brothers. I wanted to be better than the guys on TV, right? Yes. Look, I, I want you to be better than me. But ask me how to do it. Don't just, you know, uh, everything has to be incentive laden. I know. Here you go. You can have it's, a. You, I'm telling right. you, mom's the word, dude. Even if mom's, look, I, I raised my five, you know, the two boys, three girls, they all out like you. I, I've been there, done that. And it's like, and I told them, I said, you'll thank me one day if I'm still alive when you're grown and on your own. And they do, they come back and they was like that because they tell each other, we weren't raised like that. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. That's like, exactly. that's the thank you. Because the world tells them different. That the world, they, they like, no. They know how to, they all went to college, two graduated, three didn't. Because I told them, I said, college is not for everybody. I was like, but you got the grades because I put you in the school that I knew you need to be educated in. I've worked, I sacrificed and, and made it, made the opportunity for you. And that's what yep. people don't understand. It's the opportunity. It's, yeah. it's, it's the line that I always use with Clint Eastwood. Um, he was in the movie, he was a drill sergeant. Improvise, adapt, overcome your situation. Improvise, yeah. adapt, overcome your simple way, your situation. So you improvise, you analyze the situation, you adapt to it, and now you overcome it. And it just, I heard that in the, in the movie that he was a drill sergeant and he, he was like, retire. I know, retire. I know the movie, I can't think of the yeah, name of it. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm talking about. But yeah. I mean, but those little nuggets like that, those are life things that, that we, that we can get that's like that. That's a true statement there. That's yeah. a true fact to where is that you got to have goals. Nobody has goals. And if they do have goals, you got to put a plan into action and they don't understand Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant. They don't understand. They like, Oh, those are killers. There's this and that. No, they're sharing wisdom, but they're sharing their wisdom and their determination. And so now people want to make a mockery because Mike took it personal because Kobe took on the same mentality as Mike, but he called it mama. And they, okay, if, if that's what they wanted to be, then they accomplished that. Dude, do you know they accomplished it? They wanted to be the best in the world. And they became that, you know? Yeah. So in a sport, do you know how hard that is to do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you have all the people, all the naysayers telling you you can't do it. Yeah. Now, I could have said I wanted to be the best baseball player, but if they don't put me in the lineup, I can't show my baseball skills. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you don't put the work in, right? You just don't automatically get put in the lineup because you can, because you, know, because you want to play. Right. Right? Exactly. What, 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 just because you think you can box doesn't mean you can get in the ring with Ali, right? That's what. Uh, <laughs> or right, Tyson. Right? Or Tyson. Yeah. Everybody it, can box until they get hit in the mouth. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Until you prove it, and that's the problem. They don't want to prove it. They just want they want it gifted to them. 
Right? Yeah, that would happen to Nate yeah. Robinson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's another story. But yeah, oh yeah. my goodness. That's it. That's but see, but, we're we we're, we're yeah. professionals. They don't understand about what a professional is. And that's what yeah. I'm grateful for. Like you said, in in the nineties. I played with Lenny Dykstra, Darren Dalton, John Crook. They was the, the all-stars on the team. But Lenny Dykstra was my guy because Doc Gooden and Daryl Strawberry took him under the wings. And then Lenny, when I got with the Phillies, he took me under his wing and said, I know the brothers, man, blah, blah, blah. He knew the story. He knew the path. He knew yeah. the Doc and how would Doc come from in Tampa and how Strawberry come from in Crenshaw and Eric Davis and them, how they grew up out there in L.A. And... He was playing with them in the minor leagues and, and everything with the Jackson Mets, which is the stadium we used to play the the white schools uh, in Mississippi Jackson State. That's where we would play all of the uh, the Mississippi State, LSU's, New Orleans. When they came to town, they didn't play on our campus. They didn't play on that field. They played. We played at the Jackson Mets field. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Now we played all the other SWAC teams on our campus on that field, but the yeah. the white schools, the white universities, they didn't play on there. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> that was another motivation. Look, as Mike said, I took that person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh my you, goodness. You can't make it up. But see, when you're born and raised in that. And that when you're born and raised in Mississippi, you, you're you're cultured to that lifestyle. I'm born and raised in Chicago. I'm cultured to that lifestyle. I ain't saying I'm not able to adapt to it. I'm not saying I'm not able to improvise and overcome it. But like my mom told me, you would, you know, improvise, adapt, and overcome and become a young man. And I became yeah. a young yeah. man at 18 years old. And you know, you straight out of Chicago. It brought you to where you are today. Yes, sir. I appreciate yeah. that. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So, so your book, people can. Where can you find the book? Uh, on on at Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. Yeah, the okay. Kindle, the Kindle, uh, at the Kindle store, Amazon. Uh, dot com. Kindle store, and they can people can follow you on social media. Where? Yeah, they can follow me at uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. That's it. I'm not. Uh, you know, I, we got to keep a low profile. I'm not on Facebooks like that, and uh, I just do LinkedIn professionally and Twitter. It's, it's entwined together. I mean, I don't even know how long I'll be on Twitter. You know, we, you know, it's just going to flow, man. I, yeah. On LinkedIn and Twitter. I'm learning too. Yeah. yeah I'm it, learning all that stuff as well too, so. Because you got all, it, yeah. I had, somebody created a, 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 a they they tried to steal my identity for Facebook and all that. So I created oh, yeah. a burn account, had to go through all, everything on there. And so I just created a burner account and to, to to get it out the way. And so the police finally got it taken down because Facebook would not take it down. They put all my baseball cards on. Everybody thought it was me. And I'm like, no, nah, that's not me. You know, no. Yeah. But you got uh, people liking it and all that. They thinking it's you. Yeah. And I don't, I don't work exactly. that way. But so that's why the main reason why I never did get on Facebook or Instagram. It's, gotcha. it's like forget it. You know, once we almost, I'm 57. We almost 60 years old. I ain't got time to deal with that, man. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, man. Well, I appreciate you jumping on today, Wes. We, I yeah. mean, I had fun listening to this, listening to these stories. Like I said, we'll have to revisit some of these other stories okay. as we get down the road and see. But, you Thanks. know, best of luck with everything. And we'll stay in touch. And like yeah. I said, I'll share this with you once we get it all done and okay. everything else. So, man, but I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, keep keep fighting a good fight, man. That's trying, right. Trying to change it. So, and right, I appreciate yeah. it, though, Wes. I appreciate you Thanks, having man. I had the ball, man. I had a blast. Yes, sir. Absolutely, <laughs> man. We could do definitely do this again. Okay, man. You have a good All one, right. and God bless you, man. Uh